All food is one form of life killing and eating another form of life. When you eat rice, several rice plants were killed to make that possible. When you eat any seed, be it grains or dal, it is a living baby plant, an embryo. The cells in the onion you cut release an enzyme as they die, an enzyme that catalyzes a reaction that makes a volatile chemical that breaks down into dilute sulfuric acid in your eyes as a way of saying, please don't kill me. However, there are two exceptions. Foods whose consumption does not directly involve the death of a living thing. One is honey. And it's a bit tricky. Talented and ethical beekeepers can harvest honey without killing bees. But it's impossible to avoid some death given how tiny bees are. And honey is also just sugar. It's not complete food. Overconsumption of honey is bad for you no matter what social media, health and wellness influencers will tell you. The second food that involves no death is the topic of this video. Milk. As mammals ourselves, milk is the first food we eat. It is complete food. Every species of mammal produces milk that is uniquely designed for that species. In fact, the word mammal comes from Latin for mammary gland. Everything from a tiny rat to us humans to the largest animal in the history of the planet, the blue whale, is a mammal. Now, human beings are the only species of animal that consumes the milk of another species in addition to human breast milk. And that is a relatively recent innovation of human civilization. As we transition from being hunter-gatherers to farming, we first domesticated plants, particularly grasses that gave us cereal grains like rice, wheat, millets, and corn. We also domesticated cows, goats, and sheep. Herbivores that ate agricultural waste like hay and turned it into high-quality animal protein that we had to work hard to hunt in the past. And some of these animals, ancient human beings observed, produced more milk than their young needed. So we carefully bred the ones that produced extra. And over thousands of years, we now have cattle that produce four times more milk daily than what a calf requires. Now, you might wonder, why cows and buffaloes? Each species has its own unique milk that has evolved by Darwinian selection over millions of years to meet its nutritional needs. Young whales have to build a layer of fat quickly to survive, so whale milk has about 34 to 35% fat as opposed to human milk, which only has about 4.5%. Northern seals also need to acquire fat quickly, so a seal's milk has about 53 to 54% fat, making it the fattiest milk of all mammals. Apart from the logistical difficulties of milking whales and seals, both whale and seal milk are not suitable for human consumption. Human babies like and only need about 4.5% fat, 1.1% protein, 6.8% lactose, and about 87% water. Interestingly, and not so surprisingly, the milk closest to that of humans is milk from primate monkeys. But again, chimpanzee or gorilla dairies, not very practical. Cow, and to an extent buffalo, is a reasonably close match in terms of fat, protein, and sugar content. So presumably, after likely experimenting with various animals, humans mostly now consume the milk of cows and buffaloes, and to a smaller extent, sheep and goats. All of this was when humans were mostly agricultural. And farming households will likely have a few cows and goats to provide the family with milk every day morning, only in the months after one of the animals has given birth. But as we urbanize, clearly it's not practical to have cows in your balcony, if you even have a balcony. So over time, different parts of the world figured out how to collect, store, and distribute milk. And this allowed urban societies to thrive and grow. So before we go further, let's quickly review what milk typically contains. Water makes up roughly 87% of milk. Carbohydrates. Lactose is the primary sugar in milk. Lactose is a disaccharide made up of one glucose and one galactose molecule. Our bodies use an enzyme called lactase to break this bond to digest lactose. More on this later. Protein. Milk is a complete protein containing all essential amino acids. Two kinds, casein and whey. When you add an acid like lime juice or vinegar or ferment milk, casein curdles into a solid structure while whey does not. Fat, which is saturated, 
which you can churn into butter and clarify into ghee. Vitamins and minerals like A, B12, D, calcium and potassium. By the way, these fat soluble vitamins are dissolved in the milk fat. So you get less of these if you consume low fat milk. Let's start by focusing on milk production in India because we are pretty unique. We have one third of the world's cattle, but not in giant industrial farms like the West. It's mostly individual farmers owning small numbers of cattle. So before independence, milk contractors would regularly source milk from different farmers, paying them very little, and then sell that milk to large cities like Mumbai and pocket most of the profits. Farmers were not happy. In fact, in 1942, they met Sardar Patel, who then advocated the idea of a cooperative society, where milk producers in one region would come together, collect and sell the milk to a union that would then process it, sell it and distribute the profits back to the farmers. But it wasn't till Vargis Kurian came around and made this entire complex structure a reality in Gujarat. That is the remarkable story of Amul in Anand. Now, every state has these cooperative societies and unions. We are all familiar with these brands. Avin in Tamil Nadu, Nandini in Karnataka, Milma in Kerala, Mother Dairy in Delhi. The reason this is important to understand is that social media of late paints milk production as some evil industrial enterprise. In India, it is not. It is individual farmers in cooperative societies. So once milk is collected, it needs to be pasteurized. A century ago, thousands of people would die every year as a result of bacterial pathogens in raw milk. Now, no one except the silly people who still insist on consuming raw milk dies from this. The reason for that is pasteurization. In a country like India, where you have no way to standardize the hygiene across the millions of individual farms where milk is collected, you do not want to take the risk of consuming raw milk. Some people will say, but the baby calf drinks it unpasteurized. Boss, the baby calf has a much stronger immune system specifically tuned to the bacteria that will be present in the cow's milk than you do. Likewise, human babies are tuned to the bacteria present in mother's milk. Even if it doesn't harm you, it will still cause the milk to spoil sooner. So pasteurization is the application of heat for a short duration of time to kill existing microbes in milk. Now, social media influencers will tell you that pasteurization destroys nutrients, but they never tell you what nutrients. So let me tell you, any form of heating destroys some water-soluble vitamins and enzymes. That's all. Nothing else. You can get those vitamins from vegetables in your diet. The risk of harm from raw milk is much higher than the risk of you not getting enough vitamins. So please don't consume raw milk. There are some who claim that the enzymes present in raw milk prevent lactose intolerance. They do not. We will address lactose intolerance later in this video. All right. Now that the milk is pasteurized, it needs to be standardized. So cows and buffaloes are not factories that can produce the exact amount of fat you like in your milk. And depending on the season, summer or winter, and whether it's the cow's first calf or its sixth, the quality of the milk will vary widely. So the fat percentage in milk needs to be made consistent. So in India, we have the following standards. To do this, all the milk is collected from various farmers, is mixed together, and the milk is separated into cream, which is the fat, and skim milk, and then reconstituted into the exact fat percentages you need for specific packets of milk that you buy from the store. And because seasonal variations in fat percentage can be very high, milk producers will also dehydrate the milk, meaning remove all water and use that milk powder to make sure that you get the same quality of milk all through the year. Again, there is a lot of ignorant scaremongering about the use of milk powder. It's milk minus water. No nutrients are lost. The next step is homogenization. Yet again, a term that social media has made seem far more scary than it is. It is simply the process of ensuring that the fat globules in milk are all the same uniform size. Before homogenization, milk fat globules can be anywhere from 0.1 to 15 micrometers. So we pass this milk through a plate with tiny holes that are the exact size we want for the fat globules. And that's it. There is no chemical processing involved here. What this does is prevent your packet milk from separating into cream, malai, and skim milk when sitting inside your fridge. So on a practical note, if you want a creamier feeling tea, coffee, or hot chocolate, 
go for homogenized milk. But if you are looking to extract cream, malai, to make rabdi or butter or ghee, buy unhomogenized milk. Please note, both homogenized and unhomogenized milk have the same fat, protein and lactose percentage. The fat is just more evenly and stably dispersed in homogenized milk. Now, you might have seen these packets of milk in stores that are not kept in the fridge. And the packet will also tell you that this milk will last for months at room temperature. And you might wonder, how on earth does that work, given how quickly milk tends to spoil? This is called UHT ultra high temperature processing. If you heat milk to 135 or 150 Celsius for one to six seconds, followed by cooling and packaging, it kills all microorganisms and hence UHT sterilized milk can be stored at room temperature for up to six months or till you open the packet. Because of the short time of exposure to heat, the original properties, color, flavor, nutrients, uh, etc. of milk are better retained in UHT sterilized milk as compared to conventionally pasteurized milk. In fact, many coffee shops will use UHT milk because it's easier to deal with in a country like India where electricity supply for refrigeration may not be reliable. In nature, mammals only consume the milk of their own species. And at one point of time, a gene turns on and your ability to digest lactose in milk goes away. This is to prevent babies in nature from being too dependent on mother's milk so that they can switch to solid food. In humans, there is a mutation that is said to have occurred in ancient humans who lived in the Central Asian steppes. These people migrated to both Europe and North India over 4,000 years ago and mixed with the local population, as a result of which, India has a unique distribution of people. More than 70% of people in the North and West can digest milk as adults, while more than 70% of people in the South and East cannot. This is why in the South and East, there is less direct milk consumption and more curd or dahi consumption, where the lactobacteria eat the lactose and turn it into lactic acid. Again, it's important to understand lactose intolerance is a spectrum. It's not like you can't digest any milk product. Some people can drink lots of milk as adults, some a little less, and a few people not at all. And even those who have mild intolerance can still consume things like paneer or curd, both of which are low in lactose. All right, as always, let's address the most common milk-related myths. Number one, A1 versus A2 milk. A1 and A2 are two types of beta casein proteins in milk with a difference in just one amino acid. Milk by default has a mix of both A1 and A2 proteins. Now, there were some studies in the past that claimed that the breakdown of A1 protein can sometimes result in the formation of a molecule called BCM7 in our body, which has been linked to health problems such as type 1 diabetes, heart disease, etc. However, more recent studies have found no such link. Now, another myth is that A2 milk comes from native Indian breeds while A1 comes from foreign breeds. This is also quite silly. For starters, it's a marketing gimmick. Other countries have had the same marketing gimmick for way longer than we have. A1 milk comes mainly from cow breeds originating in Northern Europe, while A2 milk mainly comes from cow breeds from the Channel Islands and Southern France. Their milk contains higher amounts of the A2 beta casein protein. So this A2 protein has been part of cow milk for thousands of years, and it's not exclusive to Indian breeds. Fun fact, Indian buffalo milk is A2 milk. But if you still want to pay four to five times more for desi A2 milk, go for it. One thing I will mention, many NRIs have reported that A2 milk in the US, not from Indian cows by the way, works better for them than the regular A1 milk that you get in the supermarket. As always, buy what works for your digestive system and stop believing in marketing gimmicks and scaremongering. Myth number two, are there growth hormones in the packet milk I buy? Is it making girls go into puberty sooner? For starters, hormones are species specific. If the hormones of one species could affect another species, imagine what a lion or a tiger will go through given that they only eat meat. Secondly, growth hormone is a protein, not a steroid, and it gets completely broken down by our digestive system. Third thing, this has nothing to do with puberty. Puberty ages are coming down in many parts of the world over the last century because 
we've started feeding our girl children as well as we did our boy children remember this is still a country where female infanticide is still a problem undernourishment typically means that puberty is postponed we've simply assumed that the average puberty age from an era when girl children were mostly undernourished is the correct puberty age if you look at the data globally 9 to 11 years old is quite normal for puberty in children who are not undernourished so calm down your milk has nothing to do with this last and most persistent myth can you mix dairy products and meat influencers will tell you according to ayurveda you must not but please ignore them you can mix many people do and have no problems bengalis make doi mach south indians consume fish fry and curd rice tikkas and kebabs are marinated in yogurt the french and italians make white sauce with milk and add meat to it and they live much longer than we do in summary eat what you like what works for you and does not cause you digestive issues on a closing note when you get a chance head outside the city where there are no lights and gaze at the night sky you will see a white band across the heavens a band that in sanskrit is called akash ganga the celestial equivalent of the life giving and nourishing river a band that has a cosmic connection to the ocean of milk kshira sagara that when churned brings up the nectar of immortality a band that finds a reference in the mahabharata has ganga's son bhishma lies dying upon a bed of arrows looking at the celestial equivalent of his mother across the sky imparting wisdom to the pandavas a band that the ancient romans called via lactea or the milky way a band that the ancient greeks considered to be the milk of the goddess hera again milk that gave immortality that band is the orion arm of the milky way galaxy galaxy that is home to our sun and earth and every single one of us and the word galaxy comes from galactos the greek word for milk we are nourished by milk as we are born nourished by it as we live our lives and we become one with the milky way galaxy as we pass on